This is my brick. But this brick is different than an ordinary brick. My brick was grown with the help of trillions of tiny workers. Bacteria with the unique ability to grow cement. Ever since I was a child, I have been fascinated with the act of making, from building sandcastles on the beach to sloppy mud pies at my grandmother's house. As a child, I preferred to get dirty by making my toys with my hands rather than playing with dolls. This desire to build with my hands led me to the study of architecture. While in architecture school, I understood the brick to be the lowest common denominator in construction. Bricks are made and sized to fit in the human hand. They are modular, easy to make, and straightforward to use. This simplicity in design has led the humble brick to be used in over 80% of global construction. Did you know that according to the Carbon War Room, each year, we produce over 1.23 trillion bricks worldwide? Stacked end to end, they could reach the moon and back to Earth 325 times. Bricks are made using clay from the ground and then firing them at high temperatures for hardening. It has been estimated that the production of this many bricks emits over 800 million tons of carbon pollution into our atmosphere every year. That's actually more pollution than what is produced by all the airplanes in the world every year. When you think about it, This is a lot of pollution from one simple material. According to William McDonough, a leading renowned sustainable architect, in his film, Waste Equals Food, 200 million new homes are needed in rural China. If the traditional material of brick is used, 25% of the top layer of agricultural land is needed for the clay, and over half of the coal reserves in China for fuel to fire the bricks. There is a better, cleaner, and more sustainable way to make bricks. Why use fire to harden them when you can grow them? My introduction to sustainable alternatives leading through the journey of growing bricks started in graduate school. My professor, Peter Lynch, introduced me to a book called Biomimicry. In the book, the author Janine Banius introduces biomimicry as the study of learning from nature. This led me to wonder how an architect could make a difference using nature. I thought, instead of just learning from nature, what if we could literally use nature in our manufacturing process? But not just as an idea, as a real execution of the idea that requires rolling up the sleeves and getting into the process. My professor and I both believed that the next greatest material revolution would be in durable structural cements, similar to those made in the ocean, like seashells and coral reefs. Nature can produce materials with greater strengths than our man-made processes and with less energy without polluting the surrounding environment. Due to the rapid depletion of our fossil fuel resources, we are forced to look for sustainable alternatives into how we make the materials that construct our built environment. As an example of strong materials produced by nature, this spider can weave silk that is stronger than our man-made steel by weight. Think of the spider as a tiny factory and compare that with the enormous infrastructure and energy required to make our man-made steel. So how does an architect begin to understand the details of how nature is able to produce strong and durable materials? I, I certainly didn't have the answers in my architectural education. Starting seven years ago, I had to create my own education 
and dive into the different scientific fields such as chemistry, biology, and material science. I started at the library, and then I began to take additional university courses. But most importantly, I knocked on the doors of several scientists to learn from them directly. I learned how microorganisms such as bacteria were actually responsible for the formation of some sandstones by causing a glue, or rather cement, that can bond the grains of sand together. I decided to culture my own bacteria and grow my own sandstone brick. So, as a start, I turned my second bedroom into a brick growing lab. And unfortunately, for a couple of years, we didn't have any guests stay at our apartment. <laughs> the materials that I use to grow bricks start with sand. Sand is a preferred material due to the overwhelming global abundance. Sand, especially from this Arabian desert, is traditionally not used in construction, but is ideal for the brick growing process. Next, the cement that glues or bonds the grains of sand together is made in a liquid solution, including bacteria that create a precise environment for crystals to form, food to feed those bacteria, a nitrogen source, a calcium source, and water. Finally, this solution is applied over a bed of sand in mold, repeated for five days until a solid bio cement material is formed. This process is distinctly different from how traditional clay bricks are made, where clay and sand are mixed with water, formed into the shape of a brick, and then fired at 2,000 degrees for three to five days. It took years and many, many, many mistakes to be able to grow a strong, durable, full-scale brick. I made many mistakes, and things, things went terribly wrong. For example, I would make bricks that would hold shape, but would then dissolve underwater. Not, not good for areas with lots of rain. Or even bricks that I made three years ago that today are still wet. <laughs> However, these mistakes were critical, and each time I failed, I learned more and more about the process. Finally, at the end of one day, I had some leftover sand and bacteria solutions and decided to mix them together, put them in a mold, and try out a new process. And what do you know? Five days later, a baby brick was formed. <laughs> While exciting at the time, this was just the beginning. I then had to be able to repeat this exact process thousands of times and scale this small brick up to full scale for production. The challenges along the way in this journey have included my own personal transition from the architectural world into the scientific community and being able to learn a new language to be able to speak with multiple scientists. I decided to transition over from architecture to making, or rather growing, bricks full-time as a company. And I now have a lab much larger than my second bedroom. Currently, I'm working with teams in both the US and the UAE to scale up this process for producing high-volume batches of these bricks at a time. What we have found is that the process for growing bricks is similar to how we manufacture our plants in greenhouses. Instead of using fire to harden the bricks, a process for growing them with irrigation to feed the bacteria is used. Since these bricks are alive, they require multiple feedings of solution and are made in ambient temperatures. Once the bricks have reached the desired hardness, they are simply dried and ready for use. As for the bacteria, once their food and water supply has been cut off, they simply die. The irrigation solution is fully recycled in a closed-loop system. This not only is important to save water resources, but also, most importantly, 
to capture a natural byproduct of the bacteria. This natural byproduct is valuable and is recovered as a natural fertilizer. This is an image of me at my first day on the beach. Instead of running to the water to play with my brother and sister, I stopped at the sand and picked up my very first seashell. The fascination and curiosity about how this shell was made has stayed with me. Something this small defined my life. Perhaps there is some curiosity from nature like this in each of you. If an architect can turn into a scientist, what other disciplines are out there that can apply nature in the way we make our physical world? Nature has already figured out some of our greatest clean manufacturing challenges. Imagine a world where the small and humble brick were grown rather than being fired. We could reduce our dependency on fossil fuels and prevent 800 million tons of carbon pollution from entering our atmosphere. As our populations continue to increase and our demand for new construction rises, we are forced to look for alternative solutions that save fossil fuels and precious agricultural land. We now have the opportunity to revolutionize our aging manufacturing processes to include biology towards a real impact of a sustainable future. Following the 19th and 20th centuries of physics that enabled the Industrial Revolution, we are now in the century of biology. Thank you.